Will today be the day that the Prime Minister commits to that specifically? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, as I said in my previous answer, the Government is committed to the new hospitals programme. We've committed record sums to NHS Capital, not just for that programme, but for smaller scale upgrades across the country. And those conversations with her trust and others are happening in the same way across the country. And I look forward to those conversations continuing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, governments at all level, national and local, should always strive to, de to deliver value for money for the taxpayer, yeah, 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 yeah. particularly in a cost of living yeah. crisis. Therefore, does the Prime Minister share my astonishment that my local Labour-led <laughs> Westminster Council oh, yeah. voted last week to raise council tax by 2%, Housing tenant, council tenants went by 7% and increased allowances for its senior councillors by up to a staggering 45%. I miss you've got to answer. Well, Mr. Can I just say, Prime Minister, I don't know who's giving you the advice, but take it from the chair. Please answer. Mr. Speaker, it is disappointing to see that I think it's been just under a year that the now Labour-run Westminster Council has put its own councillors' pay ahead of everything else. I, ca I can't quite believe the figures that we heard from our honourable friend. A staggering, an eye-watering 45% pay increase when people across our country and indeed the ward are suffering cost of living pressures. It's clear, Mr Speaker, that it's only Conservative-run councils that deliver for their residents. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, every child in the UK is entitled to free NHS dental treatment, but with 80% of practices not accepting children as new patients, is the Prime Minister proud of his record on our children's dental health? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, we're investing £3 billion in NHS dentistry, and because of the reforms to the contract, there will be about 10% more activity this year above contracted levels. There are 500 more dentists in the NHS today, but also, I think, almost a 45% increase in the amount of dental care being provided to children. Eric Thomas. Mr Speaker, five years ago, £40 million of public funds were set aside for brain tumour research, but recent government figures suggest that a little as quarter of that money has been deployed to researchers. The mechanism to distribute research funding effectively is broken. As a result, the brain tumour community has not seen the breakthroughs in treatment and survival rates that many of us believe they should have. Does my, Prime Minister, does my friend the Prime Minister agree with me that a unique, complex disease needs a unique response? And in what is Brain Tumour Awareness Month, will he make brain cancer a critical research priority across all cancers? Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, can, I, uh, can I thank my honourable friend for his thoughtful and powerful question? He's absolutely right about the importance of medical research being expedited so we can deliver better care for the people who are affected. I'll make sure that he gets a meeting with the relevant minister so we can ensure that that funding gets out to the people who need it and we can bring relief to them as quickly as we can. Joanna yeah. Chuck. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, with the encouragement of the British government, female prosecutors and female judges in Afghanistan stood up for the rule of law and for a more inclusive and equal nation. Yeah. Those left behind are in mortal danger. Yeah. Yeah. Last year, I met with senior officials at the Foreign Office who were open to making a specific case for at least some of these women to be relocated to the United Kingdom. But nothing has happened since then. This dire situation requires a prime ministerial intervention. So I'm not asking to meet the prime minister's officials or his ministers, I'm asking him directly, will he meet with me to see what we can do for these women? Yeah. Prime Minister. I'm very happy to meet with the uh, Honourable Lady, and she will know that we take our obligations to those who helped and served in Afghanistan extremely seriously, both through the Arab scheme and the ACRS scheme. We have already brought 20,000 refugees from Afghanistan to the UK. We've worked closely with the UNHCR and others on those legal routes, but I'd be happy to meet with her to ensure that we're targeting our compassion, our generosity on the people who most need it and not those who are coming here illegally. Caroline Anderson. Mr. Speaker, at the height of the pandemic, centre assessed grades allowed our young people to move forward with their lives. Lara my very brave young constituent, is now battling cancer and will not sit the GCSE exams she has worked 
so hard for and could be left with only a certificate of recognition. In exceptional circumstances such as these, why can't the same principle apply? Would my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, look compassionately at this situation? Yeah. Prime Minister. Start by sending my best wishes to Lara and thanking my honourable friend for raising her case uh, in, in Parliament. Of course, it's incredibly upsetting and challenging for children and young people to be diagnosed with a serious illness and especially so close to their exams. Now, there are um, allowances that are made and in the first instance, students will speak to their school or their college to make those reasonable adjustments, but I'll be happy to make sure that we work with my honourable friend to find a resolution in Lara's case. Dr Rupert Hutt. Mr Speaker, I welcome the PM's numeracy drive, but did he know that some 7.1 million adults in England are functionally illiterate is often diagnosed late in life, like with TV's Jay Blades, if at all. So would he thank the entirely voluntary Read Easy, who are turning this round at just £250 cost per new reader, and commit to a national strategy for eradicating this problem that's costing our economy £25 billion a year in lost competitiveness? Well, uh, well Mr. Mr Speaker, I agree with the Honourable Lady. Literacy and numeracy are critical uh, for adults to be able to participate, both in society and the economy. I'm happy to praise Read Easy for the work that they do. I look forward to learning more about them. But the best way to solve this problem is to ensure that our young children get the, the reading skills and training and education that they need. And I'm so pleased that because of the reforms introduced by this previous or previous Conservative governments, particularly with phonics, we have now marched up the international league table and have some of the best results for reading that we've seen in a very long time. Richard Fuller. Thank you, Mr Speaker. More than a quarter of the economic output of this country is in sectors overseen by some of our major regulators, such as Ofwad and Ofgem, but historically there's been very little in the way of oversight to say whether they're doing a good job or a bad job, whether they're achieving international best practice or not. So can the Prime Minister look to see what he can do to address this historical oversight and enable regulators to play their part in ensuring economic growth? I'm well, Mr Speaker, as always, my honourable friend makes a, a very thoughtful point, and he's absolutely right about the importance of our regulators in driving growth, competitive investment in our economy. I know the Chancellor will have something to say on this later on, but he should rest assured that we will keep at it to make sure that there is accountability and oversight of our regulators. We all want to see more growth in our economy, and they need to play their part in delivering it. Red Stringer. Mr Speaker, 20 years after defeat in the Second World War, uh, the first Japanese bullet train travelled <coughs> the 300 miles from Tokyo to Osaka at 200 miles an hour. Isn't it a measure of the government's incompetence, yeah. lack of commitment to the regions, uh, lack of commitment to infrastructure, that it is now expected that 24 years after a Conservative Transport Secretary announced that HS2 would happen, that Birmingham, Manchester and London will not be linked by that time? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. 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 Speaker, we're actually delivering the biggest <laughs> rail investment. Mr. Speaker, the, the, the biggest, the biggest rail investment, the biggest rail investment since the Victorian era. I would just gently point out to the honourable gentleman, com compared to when Labour uh, were last in office, the investment, the investment going into the north is 30% higher every single year under this Conservative government. We are delivering for communities across the north with more trains, more buses, more stations and more roads because a Conservative government doesn't just talk about it, it gets on and delivers it. Sir Robert Deal. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I hope very much that later today we'll hear news of help for motorists and small businesses. But for most just the small businesses in Bromley and the rest of outer London, they're going to be hard hit later this year by the Mayor of London's yeah. stealth tax in the form of an optional emission yeah. charge. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cost, yeah. money and jobs. Isn't it time to revisit the Local Government Act and, re and revise it so that such charges can only be imposed on London boroughs with the consent of the boroughs themselves? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, my honourable friend makes an excellent point, and it's right that the, uh, the Mayor of London should listen to the voices of commuters, of families, and of small businesses 
as he inflicts this damaging tax on them. This government will always be on the side of those people, and this budget will deliver for them too. And completes Prime Minister's questions. Order! Order! Before I call the Chancellor of the Exchequer, I have to remind honourable members that copies of the budget resolutions will be available to them from the vote office in members' lobby at the end of the Chancellor's statement and, of course, online. It might also be helpful for some people who are following our proceedings to know that British Sign Language interpretation of the statement, which will continue until the end of the speech of the spokesman for the Scottish National Party, is available to watch on ParliamentLive.tv advert. Uh, live subtitling will also be available for the Chancellor's speech and the remainder of today's debate. I hardly need remind honourable members, but I will do for good measure that they may not make interventions during the Chancellor's statement, nor indeed during the replies of the Leader of the Opposition, or even of the spokesman for the Scottish National Party. <laughs> Call a Chancellor of the Exchequer. Yeah! Madam Deputy Speaker, in the face of enormous challenges, I report today on a British economy which is proving the doubters wrong. In the autumn, we took difficult decisions to deliver stability and sound money. Since mid-October, 10-year guilt rates have fallen, debt servicing costs are down, mortgage rates are lower, and inflation has peaked. The International Monetary Fund says our approach means the UK economy is on the right track. Yeah. But we remain vigilant and will not hesitate to take whatever steps are necessary for economic stability. Today, the Office for Budget Responsibility forecasts that because of changing international factors and the measures I take, the UK will not now enter a technical recession this year. Yeah. They forecast, they, they forecast we will meet the Prime Minister's priorities to halve inflation, reduce debt and get the economy growing. We are following the plan and the plan is working. But that's not all we've done. In the face of a cost of living crisis, we have demonstrated our values by protecting struggling families with a £2,500 energy price guarantee, one-off support, and the uprating of benefits with inflation. Taken together, these measures are worth £94 billion over this year and next, one of the largest support packages in Europe. That averages, Madam Deputy Speaker, over £3,300 of cost-of-living help for every household in the country. Today, we deliver the next part of our plan, a budget for growth. Yeah. Not just the growth that comes when you emerge from a downturn, but long-term, sustainable, healthy growth that pays for our NHS and schools, finds jobs for young people, and provides a safety net for older people, all whilst making our country one of the most prosperous in the world. Prosperity with a purpose, and that is why growth is one of the Prime Minister's five priorities for our country. I deliver that today by removing obstacles that stop businesses investing, by tackling labour shortages that stop them recruiting, by breaking down barriers that stop people working, and by harnessing British ingenuity to make us a science and technology superpower. Yeah. I start with the forecasts produced by Richard Hughes and his team at the Independent Office for Budget Responsibility, who I thank for their diligent work. They have looked in detail at the Prime Minister's economic priorities. The first of those is to halve inflation. 
Inflation destroys the value of hard-earned pay, deters investment, and foments industrial strife. This government remains steadfast in its support for the Independent Monetary Policy Committee at the Bank of England as it takes action to return inflation to the 2% target. Despite continuing global instability, the OBR report today that inflation in the UK will fall from 10.7% in the final quarter of last year to 2.9% by the end of 2023. That is more than halving inflation. High inflation is the high inflation, Madam Deputy Speaker, is the root cause of the strikes we've seen in recent months. We will continue to work hard to settle those disputes, but only in a way that does not fuel inflation. Part of the fall in inflation predicted by the OBR happens because of additional measures I take today. Firstly, I recognise that even though wholesale energy prices have been falling there is still enormous pressure on family finances. Some people remain in real distress, and we should always stand ready to help when we can. So after listening to representations from Martin Lewis and other experts, I today confirm that the energy price guarantee will remain at £2,500 for the next three months. This means the £2,500 cap for the typical household will remain in place when energy prices remain high ahead of an expected fall in prices from July. This measure will save the average family a further £160 on top of the energy support measures already announced. The second measure concerns over 4 million households on prepayment meters. They're often the poorest households, but they currently pay more than comparable customers on direct debit. Ofgem has already agreed with suppliers a temporary suspension to forced installations of prepayment meters. But today I go further and confirm we will bring their charges in line with comparable direct debit charges. Under a conservative government, the energy premium paid by our poorest customers, our poorest households is coming to an end. Next, I have listened to representations from the Honourable Members for East Devon, North Cornwall, Combe Valley and Central Suffolk and North Ipswich about the risk to community facilities, especially swimming pools, caused by high costs. When times are tough, such facilities matter even more. So today I am providing a 63 Today, I am providing a £63 million fund. Order! We want to hear what the Chancellor of the Exchequer is actually saying. Enough, Chancellor. Today, I am providing a £63 million fund to keep our public leisure centres and pools afloat. I have also heard from my right honourable friend, the Charities Minister, and his Secretary of State about the brilliant work third sector organisations are doing to help people struggling in tough times. They can often reach people in need that central or local government cannot. So I will give his department £100 million to support thousands of local charities and community organisations do their fantastic work. I also note the personal courage of one of my predecessors, my right honourable friend from Bromsgrove, in talking about the tragedy of suicide and the importance of preventing it. We already invest a lot in this area, but I will assign an extra £10 million over the next two years, nearly a million pounds for every year that he's been in Parliament, to help the voluntary sector play an even bigger role in stopping families experiencing that intolerable heartache. My penultimate cost of living measure concerns one of our other most treasured community institutions, the Great British Pub. In December, I extended the alcohol duty freeze until the 1st of August, after which duties will go up in line with inflation in the usual way. But today, I will do something that was not possible when we were in the EU and significantly increase the generosity of draft relief so that from the 1st of August, the duty on draft products in pubs will be up to 11 pence lower than the duty in supermarkets. 
It's a differential a Conservative government will maintain as part of a new Brexit pubs guarantee. Yeah. <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker, British ale is warm, but the duty on a pint is frozen. Yeah. And even better, even better, thanks to the Windsor framework negotiated by my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, that change will now apply to every pub in Northern Ireland. Yeah. And finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, I have heard, I've heard the representations from the Honourable Member for Stoke-on-Trent North, my Right Honourable Friend for Witham, and my Right Honourable Friend from South Thanet and the Sun newspaper about the impact on motorists of the planned 11 pence rise in fuel duty. I noticed the party opposite called for a freeze on this duty. Somehow they forgot to tell the British people they have voted against every single fuel duty freeze for the last 12 years. Because because inflation remains high, I have decided now is not the right time to uprate fuel duty with inflation or increase the duty. So here's what I'm going to do for a further 12 months. I'm going to maintain the 5p cut and I'm going to freeze fuel duty too. That saves the average driver £100 next year and around £200 since the 5p cut was introduced. Yeah. Our energy price guarantee fuel duty and duty on a pint all frozen in today's budget. That doesn't just help families, it helps the economy too, because their combined impact reduces CPI inflation by nearly three quarters of a percent this year, lowering inflation when it is particularly high. I now turn to the Prime Minister's second priority, which is to reduce debt. Here too, our plan is on track. Underlying debt is forecast to be 92.4% of GDP next year, then 97.3%, 94.6%, 94.8% before falling to 94.6% in 27-28. We are meeting the debt priority. And with a buffer of £6.5 billion, it means we are meeting our fiscal rule to have debt falling as a percentage of GDP by the fifth year of the forecast. As a proportion of GDP, our debt remains lower than the USA, Canada, France, Italy, and Japan. And because of the decisions I take today and the improved outlook for public finances, underlying debt in five years' time is now forecast to be nearly three percentage points of GDP lower than it was in the autumn. That means more money for our public services and a lower burden for future generations deeply held conservative values which we put into practice today. At the autumn statement, I also announced that public sector net borrowing must be below 3% of GDP over the same period. The OBR confirmed today that we're meeting that rule with a buffer of 39.2 billion. In fact, our deficit falls in every single year of the forecast with borrowing falling from 5.1% of GDP in 23-24 to 3.2% to 2.8% to 2.2% and 1.7% in 27-28. Even better, in the final two years of the forecast, our current budget is in surplus, meaning we only borrow for investment and not for day-to-day -day spending. Day-to-day yeah. -day departmental spending will grow at 1% a year on average in real terms after 24, 25 until the end of the forecast period. Capital plans are maintained at the same level set at the autumn statement. We will uprate tobacco duty and we will freeze the gross gaming duty yield bans. We're also maintaining the starting rate for savings and ISA subscription limits and we'll bring forward a range of measures to tackle promoters of tax avoidance schemes. Madam Deputy Speaker, taken together, today's measures lead to a slightly lower overall tax burden for the rest of the Parliament compared to the OBR's autumn forecast. Other parties run out of money, but a Conservative government is reducing borrowing and improving our public finances. By doing so, by doing so we are on track to halve inflation, get debt falling, and grow our economy, which I turn to next.
Growth, Madam Deputy Speaker, is the Prime Minister's third priority and the focus of today's budget. Thirteen years ago, we inherited an economy that had crashed. But since... They might, they might want to listen to this. They might want to listen to this. Because since 2010, we've grown more than major countries like France, Italy or Japan, about the same as Europe's largest economy, Germany. We've halved unemployment, we've cut inequality, we've reduced the number of workless households by one million. For the first time ever, because of rises in tax thresholds made by successive Conservative chancellors, people in our country can earn £1,000 a month without paying a penny of tax or national insurance. The party opposite opposed those tax reductions, but they have helped lift 2 million people out of absolute poverty after housing costs, including 400,000 pensioners and 500,000 children. That averages 80 pensioners and 100 children lifted out of poverty for every single day we've been in office. Yeah. And today, today we face the future with extraordinary potential. The World Bank said that of all big European countries, we are the best place to do business. Yeah. Global chief executives say that apart from America and China, we are the best country to invest in. We became the second country in the world to have a stock of foreign direct investment worth $2 trillion. And London has just pipped New York and 53 other global cities to be the best place in the world for female entrepreneurs. Yeah. Declinists are wrong about our country for another reason, which is our strength in new industries that will shape this century. Over the last 13 years, under conservative leadership, we have become the world's third trillion dollar tech economy after the US and China. Yeah. We've built the largest life sciences sector in Europe, producing a COVID vaccine that saved six million lives and a treatment that saved a million more. Our film and TV industry has become Europe's largest with our creative industries growing at twice the rate of the economy, our advanced manufacturing industries produce around half the world's large civil aircraft wings, and thanks to a clean energy miracle, we have become a world leader in offshore wind. Yeah. Other parties talk about a green energy revolution, so I gently remind them that nearly 90% of our solar power was installed in the last 13 years, showing... <laughs> showing it's the Conservatives who fix the roof when the sun is shining. Yeah! Now, let's turn to what the OBR say about our growth prospects. In November, they expected that the UK economy would enter recession in 2022 and contract by 1.4% in 2023. That left many families feeling concerned about the future. But today, the OBR forecast, we will not enter a recession yeah. at all this year with a contraction of just 0.2%. And after this year, the UK economy will grow in every single year of the forecast period by 1.8% in 24, 2.5%, 2.1%, .1 and 1.9% in 27. They also expect the unemployment rate to rise by less than one percentage point to 4.4%, with 170,000 fewer people out of work compared to their autumn forecast. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, that return to growth has direct consequences for our role on the global stage. I am proud that we are giving the brave people of Ukraine more military support than anyone else in Europe. Yeah. On Monday, we were, we were able to go even further with my right honourable friend announcing a five billion package of funding for the Ministry of Defence, an additional two billion pounds next year, and three billion pounds the year after. Today, following 
representations from our persuasive defence secretary, <laughs> I confirm that we will add a total of £11 billion to our defence budget over the next five years, and it will be nearly two and a quarter percent of GDP by 2025. We were the first European, we were the first large European country to commit to 2% of GDP for defence, and we will now raise that to 2.5% as soon as fiscal and economic circumstances allow. And following representations from the equally persuasive Minister for Veterans Affairs, I am today also increasing support for our brave ex-servicemen and women. We will provide a package worth over £30 million to increase the capacity of the Office for Veterans Affairs, support veterans with injuries returning from their service, and increase the availability of veteran housing. But to be Europe's biggest defender of democracy, we must build Europe's most dynamic economy. That means tackling our long-standing productivity issues, including two in particular which I address today lower business investment and higher economic inactivity than other countries. Too often, companies struggle to recruit, and even when they do, output per employee is lower. So today I set out the four pillars of our industrial strategy to address these issues. <laughs> Colleagues will know from my Bloomberg speech, they all conveniently start with the letter E, enterprise, employment, education, and everywhere. I start with... <laughs> I start, Madam Deputy Speaker, with everywhere. Our measures, well, they may not want to level up growth across the United Kingdom, but we do. This government, this government was elected on a mandate to level up. We have already allocated nearly four billion pounds in over 200 projects across the country through the first two rounds of the levelling up fund. A third round will follow. Since we started focusing on levelling up, 70% of the growth in salaried jobs has come from outside London and the South East. Yeah. And today we take further steps. Canary Wharf and the Liverpool Docks were two outstanding regeneration projects that happened under a previous Conservative government. Yeah. I pay tribute to Lord Heseltine for making them happen because they transformed the lives of thousands of people. They showed what's possible when entrepreneurs, government and local communities come together. So today I announce that we will deliver 12 new investment zones, 12 potential canary wharfs. In England, in England we've identified the following areas as having the potential to host one. West Midlands, Greater Manchester, the North East, South Yorkshire, West Yorkshire, East Midlands, Teesside, and once again, Liverpool. There will also be at least one in each of Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. <laughs> to, be, to be chosen, each area must identify a location where they can offer a bold and imaginative partnership between local government and a university or research institute in a way that catalyzes new innovation clusters. If the application is successful, they'll have access to 80 million pounds of support for a range of interventions, including skills, infrastructure, tax reliefs, and business rates retention. Working together with our formidable leveling up secretary, I also want to give some further support to leveling up areas under the E of everywhere. First, I will invest over £200 million in high-quality local regeneration projects across England, including the regeneration of Tipton Town Centre and the Marsden New Mills Redevelopment Scheme. Yeah. I'm also <laughs> announcing... <laughs> I'm also announcing a further £161 million for regeneration projects in mayoral combined authorities and the Greater London Authority, and I will make over £400 million available for new levelling up partnerships in areas that include Redcar and Cleveland, Blackburn, Oldham, Rochdale, Mansfield, South Tyneside and Bassett Law. Having listened to the case for better local transport infrastructure from many honourable members, 
I can announce a second round of the city region sustainable transport settlements allocating 8.8 billion pounds over the next five year funding period. And following a wet then cold winter, I have also received particularly strong representations from my honorable friends from North Devon, South West Devon and Newton Abbott as well as Councillor Peter Martin from my own constituency <laughs> about the curse of potholes. <laughs> the, spending, the spending review allocated £500 million every year to the potholes fund. But today I have decided to increase that fund by a further £200 million <laughs> next year to help local communities tackle this problem. For well, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, this budget delivers not only a new investment zone, but an additional £320 million for the Scottish Government, £180 million for the Welsh Government, and £130 million for the Northern Ireland Executive as a result of Barnet's consequentials. On top of which, on top of which in Scotland, I can announce up to £8.6 million of targeted funding for the Edinburgh festivals, yeah, as well yeah, as yeah. £1.5 million funding to repair the Clodagh Bridge. I will provide £20 million of funding for the Welsh Government to restore the Hollyhead Breakwater. And in Northern Ireland, I'm allocating up to £3 million to extend the tackling paramilitarism programme and up to £40 million to extend further and higher education participation. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, for levelling up to truly succeed, we need to unleash the civic entrepreneurship that's only possible when elected local leaders are able to fund and deliver solutions to their own challenges. That means giving them responsibility for local economic growth and the benefit from the upside when it happens. So this government will consult on transferring responsibilities for local economic development from local enterprise partnerships to local authorities from April 24. I will also boost Mayor's financial autonomy by agreeing multi-year single settlements for the West Midlands and Greater Combined Manchester Authority in the next spending review, something I intend to roll out for all mayoral areas over time. I've also agreed a new long-term commitment so that they can retain 100% of their business rates, something I also hope to expand to other areas. Investment zones, regeneration projects, levelling up partnerships, local transport infrastructure and business rates retention, more control for local communities over their economic destiny, so we will level up wealth and opportunity everywhere. Yeah. Today's, priority, today's priority is the Prime Minister's promise to grow the economy. We've talked about making that growth happen everywhere, so I now move on to my second E, enterprise. We need to be, we need to be, well, this has never been something of interest to the Labour Party, but the Conservatives, the Conservatives, we won't rest until we are Europe's most dynamic enterprise economy. And under a Conservative government, that is exactly what's been happening. Since 2010, we have one million more businesses in the UK, a bigger increase than Germany, France or Italy. But I want another million and another million after that. So today I bring forward enterprise measures in these three areas to lower business taxes, reduce energy costs and support our growth industries. So let's start with business taxation. Conservatives know the importance of a competitive tax regime. We already have lower levels of business taxation than France, Germany, Italy or Japan. But I want us to have the most pro-business, pro-enterprise tax regime anywhere. Even after the corporation tax rise this April, we will have the lowest headline rate in the G7, lower than any period under the last Labour government. <laughs> Only 10% of companies will pay the full 25% rate. But even at 19%, our corporation tax did not incentivize investment as effectively as countries with higher headline rates. The result is less capital investment and lower productivity than countries like France and Germany. We've already taken measures to address this. For larger business, we've had the super deduction introduced by my right honorable friend, the Prime Minister which ends this month. 
For smaller businesses, we've increased the annual investment allowance to £1 million, meaning 99% of all businesses can, can deduct the full value of all their investment from that year's taxable profits. If the super deduction was allowed to end without a replacement, we would have fallen down the international league tables on tax competitiveness and damaged growth. As a Conservative, I could not allow that to happen. So today I can announce we will introduce a new policy of full capital expensing for the next three years with an intention to make it permanent as soon as we can responsibly do so. That means that every single pound a company invests in IT equipment, plant or machinery can be deducted in full and immediately from taxable profits. It is a corporation tax cut worth an average of £9 billion a year for every year that it's in place. And its impact on the economy will be huge. The OBR says it will increase in business investment by 3% for every year it's in place. This decision makes us the only major European country with full expensing and gives us the joint most generous capital allowance regime of any advanced economy. Madam Deputy Speaker, I understand the party opposite is reviewing business taxes. Let me save them the bother. They put them up, we cut them. I also, I also want to make our taxes... I also want to make our taxes more competitive in our life science and creative industries sectors. In the autumn, I said I'd return with a more robust R&D tax credit scheme for smaller research-intensive companies. So today, I'm introducing an enhanced credit, which means that if a qualifying small or medium-sized business spends 40% or more of their total expenditure on R&D, they'll be able to claim a credit worth £27 for every £100 they spend. That means an eligible cancer drug company spending £2 million on research and development will receive over £500,000 to help them develop breakthrough treatments. It's a £1.8 billion package of support helping 20,000 cutting-edge companies who day by day are turning Britain into a science superpower. Yeah. And this government's audiovisual tax reliefs have helped make our film and TV industry the biggest in Europe. Only last month, Pinewood announced an expansion which will bring another 8,000 jobs to the UK. To give even more momentum to this critical sector, I'll introduce an expenditure credit with a rate of 34% for film, high-end television and video games, and 39% for the animation and children's TV sectors. I'll maintain the qualifying threshold for high-end television at a million pounds, and because our theatres, orchestras and museums do such a brilliant job at attracting tourists to London and the UK, I'll extend for another two years their current 45 and 50% reliefs. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, an enterprise economy needs low taxes, but it also needs cheap and reliable energy. We have already announced billions of support to help businesses reduce their energy bills through the Energy Bills Relief Scheme and the Energy Bills Discount Scheme. We've appointed Dame Alison Rose, Chief Executive of NatWest, to co-chair our National Energy Efficiency Task Force and help deliver our national ambition to reduce energy use by 15%. And to support her efforts, I'll extend the Climate Change Agreement Scheme for two years to allow eligible businesses £600 million of tax relief on energy efficiency measures. But the long-term solution is not subsidy, but security. Yeah. That means investing in domestic sources of energy that fall outside Putin or any autocrat's control. Yeah. We are world leaders in renewable energy, so today I want to develop another plank of our green economy, carbon capture usage and storage. Yeah. I'm allocating up to £20 billion of support for the early development of CCUS, starting with projects from our East Coast to Merseyside to North Wales, paving the way for CCUS everywhere across the UK as we approach 2050. That will support up to 50,000 jobs, attract private sector investment, and help capture 20 to 30 million tonnes of CO2 per year by 2030. Yeah. We have 
increased the proportion of electricity generated from renewables from under 10% when we came into office to nearly 40%. But because the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, even under the Conservatives, Madam Deputy Speaker, we will, need, we will need another critical source of cheap and reliable energy, and that is nuclear. Now, there have been no more powerful advocates for this than the Honourable Member for Innismon, yeah. Copeland, Hartlepool and Workington. They rightly say that increasing nuclear capacity is vital to meet our net zero obligations. So to encourage private sector investment into our nuclear programme, I today confirm that subject to consultation, nuclear power will be classed as environmentally sustainable in our green taxonomy. That will give it access to the same investment incentives as renewable energy. And alongside that will come more public investment. In the autumn statement, I announced the first state financed investment in nuclear for a generation, a £700 million investment in Sizewell C. Today, I can announce two further commitments to deliver our nuclear ambitions. Firstly, following representations from our Energetic Energy Security Secretary, I am announcing the launch of Great British Nuclear, which will bring down costs and provide opportunities across the nuclear supply chain to help provide one quarter of our electricity by 2050. And secondly, I am, I'm, it's so good to hear Labour in favour of nuclear energy. <laughs> Just a shame they never did any. And secondly, I'm launching the first competition for small modular reactors. Yeah. It will be completed by the end of this year. And if demonstrated as viable, we will co-fund this exciting new technology. Yeah. Finally, under the E of enterprise, Madam Deputy Speaker, I come to our innovation economy, a central area of national competitive advantage for the United Kingdom. Over the weekend, I worked night and day with the Prime Minister and the Governor of Bank of England to protect the deposits of thousands of our most cutting edge companies. We successfully secured the sale of the UK arm of Silicon Valley Bank to HSBC, so the future of those companies is now safe in the hands of Europe's biggest and one of its most creditworthy banks. But those events show that we need to build a larger, more diverse financing system where the benefits of investment in high growth firms are available to more investors. So I will return in the autumn statement with a plan to deliver that. It will include measures to unlock productive investment from defined contribution pension funds and other sources, make the London Stock Exchange a more attractive place to list, and complete our response to the challenges created by the US Inflation Reduction Act. However, when it comes to our innovation industries, there are two areas I want to make progress on today. Nigel Lawson made the City of London one of the world's top financial centres by competitive deregulation. With our Brexit autonomy, we can do the same for our high growth sectors. So today I want to reform the regulations around medicines and medical technologies. We are lucky with the MHRA to have one of the most respected drugs regulators in, in the world, indeed the very first anywhere to license a COVID vaccine. From 2024, they will move to a different model which will allow rapid, often near automatic sign off for medicines and technologies already approved by trusted regulators in other parts of the world, such as the United States, Europe and Japan. At the same time, they will set up a swift new approval process for the most cutting edge medicines and devices to ensure the UK becomes a global centre for their development. Yeah, yeah. And with an extra £10 million of funding over the next two years, they will put in place the quickest, simplest regulatory approval in the world for companies seeking rapid market access. We are proud of the life science sector, which received more inward investment than any in Europe last year. Today's change will make the UK an even more exciting place to invest. 
using our Brexit freedoms and speeding up access for NHS patients to the very newest drugs. Today, with our talented Science, Innovation and Technology Secretary, I also take measures to strengthen our position in artificial intelligence, where the UK hosts one-third of all European country, companies. I'm accepting all nine of the digital technology recommendations made by Sir Patrick Vallance in the review I asked him to do in the autumn statement. That means I can report to the House that we will launch an AI sandbox to trial new, faster approaches to help innovators get cutting-edge products to market. We'll work at pace with the Intellectual Property Office to provide clarity on IP rules so that generative AI companies can access the material they need. And we'll ask Sir Patrick's successor, Dame Angela McLean, to report before the summer on options around the growth duty for regulators. Because AI needs computing horsepower, I today commit around £900 million of funding to implement the recommendations of the independent Future of Compute review for an exascale computer. The power needed by AI's complex algorithms can also be provided by quantum computing. So today we'll publish a quantum strategy which will set out our vision to be a world-leading quantum-enabled economy by 2033 with a research and innovation program totaling two and a half billion pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also want to encourage the best AI research to happen in the UK, so we'll award a prize of one million pounds every year for the next 10 years to the person or team that does the most groundbreaking British AI research. The world's first stored program computer was built at the University of Manchester in 1948 and was known as the Manchester Baby. 75 years on, the baby has grown up, so I will call this new National AI Award the Manchester Prize in its honour. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, we want the UK to be... We want the UK to be the best place in Europe for companies to locate, invest and grow. So today's enterprise measures strengthen our technology and life science sectors, invest in energy security and for three years, but I hope permanently, cut corporation tax by £9 billion a year to give us the best incentive, in, investment incentives of any advanced economy. Yeah. An enterprise economy can only grow if it can hire the people it needs. Which brings me to my third pillar, after everywhere and enterprise. I said it was a growth budget, Madam Deputy Speaker, and we are talking about the E of employment. I'm gonna talk about a difficult topic for the party opposite now, because Brexit was a decision by the British people to change our economic model. In that, in that historic vote, our country decided to move from a model based on unlimited low-skill migration to one based on high wages and high skills. Today, we show how we will deliver that with a major set of reforms. The OBR say it is the biggest positive supply-side intervention they have ever recognized in their forecast. We have around one million vacancies in the economy, but excluding students, there are over seven million adults of working age who are not in work. That's a potential pool of seven people for every vacancy. Conservatives believe work is a virtue. We agree with the road haulage king, Eddie Stobart, who said the only place success comes before work is the dictionary. <laughs> so, so today I bring forward reforms to remove the barriers that stop people who want to from working. And I start with over 2 million people who are inactive due to a disability or long-term sickness. Thanks to the reforms courageously introduced by the Right Honourable Member for Chingford and Woodford Green, yeah. the number of disabled people in work has risen by 2 million since 2013. Yeah. But even after that, we could fill half the vacancies in the economy with people who say they would like to work despite being inactive due to sickness or disability. With Zoom, Teams and new working models that make it easier to work from home, 
This is possible now more than ever. So for that reason, the ever diligent Work and Pensions Secretary today takes the next step in his groundbreaking work on tackling economic inactivity. I thank him for that. And today we publish a white paper on disability benefits reform. It is the biggest change to our welfare system in a decade. His plans will abolish the work capability assessment in Great Britain and separate benefit entitlement from an individual's ability to work. As a result, disabled benefit claimants will always be able to seek work without fear of losing financial support. <laughs> Today, I'm going further by announcing that in England and Wales, after listening to representations from the, from the Centre for Social Justice and others, we will fund a new programme called Universal Support. Yeah. This is a new voluntary employment scheme for disabled people where the government will spend up to £4,000 a person to help them find appropriate jobs and put in place the support they need. It will fund 50,000 places every single year. We also want to help those who are forced to leave work because of a health condition such as a back pain or a mental health issue. We should give them support before they end up leaving their job. So working with our health secretary, I'm announcing a £400 million plan to increase the availability of mental health and musculoskeletal resources and expand the individual placement and support scheme. And because occupational health provided by employers has a key role to play, I'll also bring forward two new consultations on how to improve its availability and double the funding for the small company subsidy pilot. There's another group that deserve particular attention, which is children in care. They too should be given all possible help to make a normal working life possible when they reach adulthood. Often they depend on foster families who do a brilliant job. So today I'm nearly doubling the qualifying care relief threshold to £18,140, which will give a tax cut to a qualifying carer worth an average of £450 a year. I'll also increase the funding we provide to the Staying Close programme by 50%, to help more care leavers into employment. And I'll support young people with special educational needs and disabilities with a three million pilot expansion of the Department for Education supported internship program to help those people transition from education into the workplace. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, no civilized society can ignore the contribution that can be made by those with challenging family circumstances, a long-term illness or a disability. So today we remove the barriers we can with reforms that strengthen our society as well as strengthening our economy. Yeah. The next set of employment reforms affects those on universal credit without a health condition who are looking for work or on low earnings. There are more than two million job seekers in this group, more than enough to fill every vacancy in the economy. Independence is always better than dependence which is why a Conservative government believes... Which is why a Conservative... With some exceptions, Madam Deputy Speaker, independence is always better than dependence, which is why a Conservative government believes those who can work should. So sanctions will be applied more rigorously to those who fail to meet strict work search requirements or choose not to take up a reasonable job offer. And for those working low hours, we will increase the administrative earnings threshold from the equivalent of 15 hours to 18 hours at national living wage for an individual claimant, meaning that anyone working below this level will receive more work coach support alongside a more intensive conditionality regime. The next group of workers I want to support are those aged over 50. My younger officials have termed these people older workers, although as a 56-year-old myself, I prefer the term experienced. <laughs> fully, fully three and a half million people of pre-retirement age over 50 are not part of the labor force, an increase of 320,000 pounds since 320,000 since before the pandemic. We now have the 23rd highest inactivity rate for over 55s in the OECD. 
If we match the rate of Sweden, we would add more than a million people to our national labor force. Madam Deputy Speaker, I say this not to flatter you, but older people are the most skilled and experienced people we have. <laughs> country can thrive. No country can thrive if it turns its back on such a wealth of talent and ability. But for too many, turning 50 is a moment of anxiety about the cliff edge of retirement, rather than a moment of anticipation about another two decades of fulfilment. I know this, Madam Deputy Speaker, myself. After I turned 50, I was relegated to the back benches and planned <laughs> for a quiet life, but instead I decided to set an example by embarking on a new career in finance. <laughs> so today I take three steps to make it easier for those who wish to. It's going well, thank you. And today I take three steps to make it easier for those who wish to, to work longer. First, we will increase the number of people who get the best possible financial health and career guidance ahead of retirement by enhancing the DWP's excellent midlife MOT strategy. They will also increase by fivefold the number of 50 plus universal credits who receive midlife MOTs from 8,000 to 40,000 a year. Second, with my right honorable friend, the education secretary, who has a deep personal commitment to this area, will introduce a new kind of apprenticeship targeted at the over 50s who want to return to work. They will be called returnerships and operate alongside skills boot camps and sector-based work academies. They'll bring together our existing skills programs to make them more appealing for older workers, focusing on flexibility and previous experience to reduce training length. Finally, I have listened to the concerns of many senior NHS clinicians who say unpredictable pension tax charges are making them leave the NHS just when they are needed the most. The NHS is our biggest employer, and we will shortly publish a long-term workforce plan that I promised in the autumn statement. But ahead of that, I don't want any doctor to retire early because of the way pension taxes work. It's an issue I've discussed not just with the current health secretary, but a former health secretary who kindly took a break from WhatsApping his colleagues to consider it. <laughs> as, as chancellor, I have realized the issue goes wider than doctors. No one should be pushed out of the workforce for tax reasons. So today I will increase the pensions annual tax-free allowance from, by 50% from 40,000 to 60,000. Some have also asked me to increase the lifetime allowance from its £1 million limit. But I've decided not to do that. Instead, I will go further and abolish the lifetime allowance altogether. It is a pension tax reform that will stop over 80% of NHS doctors from receiving a tax charge. Incentivize our most experienced and productive workers to stay in work for longer and simplify our tax system, taking thousands of people out of the complexity. Ah, order, order. Just because the Chancellor of the Exchequer is either unpopular or popular, we still have to keep the noise down because we still have to hear what he has to say. There's more to say. Chancellor of the Exchequer. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. This is a comprehensive plan to remove the barriers to work facing those on benefits, those with health conditions and older workers. That is the E of the employment pillar of today's growth budget. Which brings me to the final pillar of our growth plan. After employment, enterprise and everywhere, I turn to the E of education. Over more than a decade, this Conservative government has driven improvement in our education system. We've risen by nearly 10 places in the international league tables for English and maths since 2015 alone. In the autumn statement, I built on this programme with an extra £2.3 billion annual investment to our schools. 
We're reviewing our approach to skills with Sir Michael Barber. We set out our plans to transform lifelong learning with a new lifelong loan entitlement. And my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, announced plans to make maths compulsory till 18. But today I want to address an issue in our education system that is bad for children and damaging for the economy. It's an issue that starts even before a child enters the gates of a school. Today I want to reform our childcare system. We have one of the most expensive systems in the world. Almost half of non-working mothers say they would prefer to work if they could arrange suitable childcare. For many women, a career break becomes a career end. Our female particip participation rate is higher than average for OECD economies, but we trail top performers like Denmark and the Netherlands. If we match Dutch levels of participation, there would be more than one million additional women working. And we can do that. So today I announce a series of reforms that start that journey. I begin with the supply of childcare. We've seen a significant decline in childminders over recent years, down 9% in England in just one year. But childminders are a vital way to deliver affordable and flexible care, and we need more of them. So I've listened to representations from my honourable friend from Stroud yeah. and decided to address this by piloting incentive payments of £600 for childminders who sign up to the profession, rising to £1,200 for those who join through an agency. I've also heard many concerns about cost pressures facing the sector. We know this is making it hard to hire staff and raising prices for parents with around two thirds of childcare providers increasing fees last year alone. So we'll increase the funding paid to nurseries providing free childcare under the hours offer by 204 million pounds from this September, rising to 288 million pounds next year. That's an average of a 30% increase in the two year old rate this year, just as the sector has requested. I will also offer providers more flexibility in how they operate in line with other parts of the UK. So alongside that additional funding, we will change minimum staff to child ratios from one to four to one to five for two year olds in, in England, as happens in Scotland, although the new ratios will remain optional with no obligation on either child minders or parents to adopt them. I want to help the 700,000 parents on universal credit who until the reforms I announced today had limited requirements to look for work. Many remain out of work because they cannot afford the upfront payment necessary to access subsidized childcare. So for any parents who are moving into work or want to increase their hours, we will pay the childcare costs upfront. Yeah. And we will increase the maximum they can claim to 951 pounds for one child and 1,630 pounds for two children, an increase of almost 50%. I turn now to parents of school-aged children who often face barriers to working because of the limited availability of wraparound care. One third of primary schools do not offer childcare at both ends of the school day, even though for many people, a job requires it to be available before and after school. To address this, we'll fund schools and local authorities to increase the supply of wraparound care so all school-age parents can drop their children off between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. And our ambition is that all schools will start to offer a full wraparound offer, either on their own or in partnership with other schools by September 2026. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, today's childcare reforms Today's childcare reforms will increase the availability of childcare, reduce costs, and increase the number of parents able to use it. Taken together with earlier conservative reforms, they amount to the most significant improvements to childcare provision in a decade. But if we really want to remove the barriers to work, we need to go further for parents who have a child under three. For them, childcare remains just too expensive. In 2010, there was barely any free childcare for under fives. A Conservative-led government changed that with free childcare for three and four-year-olds in England. It was a landmark reform, but not a complete one. 
I don't want any parent with a child under five to be prevented from working if they want to, because it's damaging to our economy and unfair mainly to women. So today I announce that in eligible households where all adults are working at least 16 hours, we will introduce 30 hours of free childcare, not just for three and four year olds, but for every single child over the age of nine months. The 30 hour offer will now start from the moment maternity or paternity leave ends. It's a package worth on average six and a half thousand pounds every year for a family with a two-year-old child using 35 hours of childcare every week and reduces their childcare costs by nearly 60%. Yeah. Because it is such a large reform, we will introduce it in stages to ensure there is enough supply in the market. Working parents of two-year-olds will be, be able to access 15 hours of free care from April 2024, helping around half a million parents. From September 24, that 15 hours will be extended to all children from nine months up, meaning a total of nearly one million parents will be eligible. And from September 25, every single working parent of under fives will have access to 30 hours free childcare per week. Madam Deputy Speaker. Mr. Perkins, stop it. Yeah. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, today we complete a landmark conservative reform. We help the economy transform the lives of thousands of women and build a childcare system comparable to the best. A major early years reform for our education system, the E of education alongside the three other pillars of our growth plan, enterprise, employment and everywhere. So Madam Deputy Speaker, in November we delivered stability, today it's growth. We tackle the two biggest barriers that stop businesses growing, investment incentives and labour supply. The best in investment incentives in Europe, the biggest ever employment package, for disabled people more help, for older people barriers removed, for families feeling the pinch, fuel duty frozen, beer duty cut, energy bills capped, and for parents, 30 hours of free childcare for all under fives. Today, we build for the future. With inflation down, debt falling, and growth up, the declinists are wrong and the optimists are right. We, we stick to the plan because the plan is working, and I commend this statement to the House. I thank the Chancellor of the Exchequer for his budget statement and I hope the House will settle down. Please, under standing order number 51, the first motion entitled, sorry, the bad behaviour is now on this side of the House. I think, I think a little bit of decorum, please, while we go through the necessary parts of the procedure. Understanding order Number 51, the first motion entitled Provisional Collection of Taxes must be decided without debate. Will the Chancellor of the Exchequer please move formally? Um, Chancellor. <laughs> Chancellor. <laughs> well, somebody, just say. <laughs> Thank you, Chancellor. I'm just putting your motions. The question is that pursuant to Section 5 of the Provisional Collection of Taxes Act 1968, provisional statutory effect shall be given to the following motions. A. Stamp duty land tax transaction funded with the assistance of a subsidy. Motion number 39. B. Fuel duties accepted machines. Motion number 44. C. Rates of tobacco products duty. Motion number 46. D. Late payment interest value added tax. Motion number 57. E. Charities value added tax, etc. Motion number 65. As many as are of that opinion, Say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Let us now consider the motion entitled Income Tax Charge, for it's on this motion that the debate will take place today and on the succeeding days. The questions on this motion 
and on the remaining motions will be put at the end of the budget debate on Tuesday, the 21st of March. So I call the Chancellor of the Exchequer to move the motion formally. Move formally. And the question is that income tax is charged for the tax year 2023 to 24. And it is declared that it's expedient in the public interest that this resolution should have statutory effect under the provisions of the Provisional Collection of Taxes Act 1968. And now I call the leader of the opposition. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I say it's good to see you back in the chair? Yeah. It's looking radiant. So for all the hype, a budget for growth that downgrades the growth forecast. Yep. Yeah. His opening boast was that things aren't quite as bad now as they were in October last year after the kamikaze budget. Yeah. Yeah. And the more that he pretends everything is fine, the more he shows just how out of touch yeah. they are. Yeah. After 13 years of his government, our economy needed major surgery. But like millions across our country, this budget leaves us stuck in the waiting room with only a sticking plaster to hand. Yeah. A country set on a path of managed decline, yeah. falling behind our competitors, the sick man of Europe once again. Yeah. This was a day for ambition, for bringing us together with purpose and intent, for unlocking the pride that is in every community, matching their belief in the possibilities of the future. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, after today, we know the Tory cupboard is as bare as the salad aisle in our supermarket. The lettuces may be out, but the turnips are in. A hopelessly divided party caught between a rock of decline and a hard place of their own economic recklessness, dressing up stagnation as stability, as their expiry date looms ever closer. Yeah. And the figures published today spell it out. A year of stagnation, growth non-existent. According to the IMF, the worst performing country in the G7 this year, a prediction today confirmed by the OBR and gr growth downgraded in years to come. This is a failure you can measure, not just in the figures, but in the empty pockets of working people right across the country. 13 years without wage growth. 13 years no better off. 13 years stuck in a doom loop of lower growth, higher taxes and broken public services. And Madam, Deputy Madam Speaker, our OBR makes clear today things don't look any better in the long run. A broken labour market holding back our prospects. Seven million on the NHS waiting lists, ill health and disability on the rise, and the consequences, as we've just heard, deferred to the future. The classic short-term sticking plaster cycle, decisions cynically ducked today, pain for working people tomorrow. It doesn't have to be like this. Britain has enormous potential on science, innovation, technology, we should be leading, not lagging. We need an industrial strategy that removes barriers to investment. And the announcements today are nowhere near the mark. The lowest investment in the G7, that's their record. All our competitors know this. They're gearing up for an almighty race for the opportunities of tomorrow. And we've got to be on the start line, not back in the changing room, tying our laces. Now, he mentioned the war in Ukraine. And of course, on this side of the House, we stand with Ukraine and we stand with the government's response to Putin's brutality. Yeah. We'll look carefully at the details of the military spending announced and we will support them. But what we cannot accept is the use of the war as a blanket excuse for failure. Yeah. Our economy has yeah. weak foundations. Global crisis hit Britain more than other countries. Yeah. Wages in this country are lower now in real terms than they were 13 years ago. The average French family is a tenth richer. The average German family, a fifth richer. Countries which face the same pandemic, countries which face the same war. And the war didn't ban onshore wind. 
The war didn't scrap our home insulation scheme. The war didn't run down our gas storage facilities. They did. Decisions which hurt working people battling the cost of living crisis right now. It's been the same story for the whole 13 years. Always the sticking plaster, never the cure, and today's budget does nothing to change that. Again, we see a failure to drip the long-term challenges. No order. People shouldn't just be speaking while the leader of the opposition is delivering his response. They should be listening. No, we will now listen to the leader of the opposition. Today's budget changes nothing. Again, we see a failure to grip the long-term challenges. No determination to create growth which unlocks the potential of the many. Working people being made to pay for Tory choices and Tory mistakes. Madam Deputy Speaker, these are the organising principles of Conservative economics. Judge them by their choices. The running down of our public services, paid for by working people. The disaster of the Tory mortgage premium, paid for by working people. The opportunities still missed for a proper windfall tax, paid for by working people. That's what makes the Chancellor's boast about lower inflation so ridiculous. The idea that it's a tax cut. British people can see through that. They see their tax burden at its highest level for 70 years. And they know it's not the government that's lowering inflation, it's working people, earning less, enjoying less. It's their sacrifice that is helping to bring inflation down. And they deserve better than another cheap trick from the government of gimmicks, making them pay whilst trying to claim the credit. And even with the price guarantee, the average energy bill has doubled in 18 months. Because of their recklessness, the average mortgage payment is up £2,000 a year. A massive hit to living standards, however they cook the books. And yet, still, no real ambition on industrial strategy. No real ambition on the clean energy that will give us cheaper bills. No real ambition on house building. The same old Tory choices, sticking plaster politics, no growth for the many, working people pay. And let's turn to his policies on the cost of living. Madam Deputy Speaker, I say his policies because there's a history to this, a pattern. Over the course of the whole cost of living crisis, time and again, it's Labour who bring the government not just to its senses, but to our position. Who first pushed for the energy price guarantee? Labour! Who first called for a proper windfall tax? Labour. Who first stood by people on prepayment meters? Labour. And who first said we should freeze the price guarantee this April? Labour. And and we can go on, because it's also Labour that first committed to extending the fuel duty cut, a policy that in January he dismissed as part of a dossier that he published. So for one poor soul in their research team at least, this really is a back-to-work budget. Yeah. And, and, a, and a word of advice for the Chancellor as he promotes this policy in coming days. Uh, use your own car, and for heaven's sake, make sure you know how to use a debit card. Yeah. And, and I look forward to the Prime Minister promoting the swimming pools policy. Yeah. Unlike the car, he won't have to borrow one of those. Yeah. But Madam Deputy Speaker, The cost of living crisis is not over. And once again, they've left money on the table when it comes to oil and gas companies. Money that could have been better spent on working people. Politics is about whose side you're on. There are loopholes that urgently need closing. Even the former CEO of Shell admitted that they should be paying more. And the long-term plan just isn't there. The same old Tory choices the same three principles, sticking plaster politics, no growth to the many, working people pay. And you see those principles at play in our broken labour market. Much of what the Chancellor said today focused on that, as well it might. The figures announced in this budget show how damaging the current situation is to growth, a long-term drag on our ability to create more wealth. Our inactivity levels 
are particularly shocking. Up half a million since the pandemic. The worst jobs recovery since the G7. People unable to work because of ill health more than ever before. Now, we will look at what the Chancellor's announced today, because on these benches, we've long called for reform of the work capability assessment for a welfare system that supports people with disabilities and long-term health conditions to thrive at work. The universal credit system must help people into employment, and childcare is a huge barrier to that. We've made the case for reform. But on childcare, of course, more money in the system is obviously a good thing. They obviously didn't listen to when he said he's actually going to do it. <laughs> they won't be here. And we've seen the Tories expand so-called free hours before. And as parents up and down the country know, it's no use having more free hours if you can't access them. And it pushes the cost for parents outside the offer. That's what we've seen before. And on pensions, he made a big spending commitment, which will benefit those with the broadest shoulders. Yeah where many people are struggling to save into their pension. Yes. We needed a fix for doctors, yep. Yep. but the announcement today is a huge giveaway to some of the very wealthiest. Exactly. The only permanent tax cut in the budget is for the richest 1%. How can that possibly be a priority for this government? The truth is our labour market is the cast iron example of an economy with weak foundations. Our crisis in participation simply hasn't happened elsewhere, not to this extent. It's a feature of Tory Britain and global excuses won't wash. We need a wider reform agenda. Instead of making working people pay, we need to make work pay. Move on from growth that's based on insecure low paid jobs to growth which comes from good work from strong employment rights that can deliver higher productivity, growth from the many for the many that makes people better off in all parts of our country. Yeah. I welcome his announcement on devolution deals. The principle that we should push power out of Westminster is fully supported on this side of the house. In fact, we want him to go further. Communities beyond Birmingham and Manchester deserve the right powers and the same powers to drive growth as well. But Madam Deputy Speaker, the Chancellor is a former Health Secretary, a published author on health, no less. He gave me a signed copy of his book. He knows that growth needs an NHS fit for the future. And no country can be fit for work when there are 7 million people on hospital waiting lists. So I was waiting for him to match Labour's ambition. Waiting for him to match our plan to train more doctors and nurses to tackle the capacity crisis. A policy he publicly praised just 15 days before he became Chancellor. And yet it never came. And Madam Deputy Speaker, if there was ever a symbol of the poverty of ambition, that is it. Because the reality is the country getting sicker is a country getting poorer. Yeah. Yeah. And a country getting poorer is a country getting sicker. Yeah. Yeah. Health and wealth must go together. Yeah. Britain can't afford to be the sick man of Europe. Yeah. Britain can't afford the Tories. Yeah. Yeah. And there is another way. On these benches, we understand institutions must be respected, constraints accepted that fiscal rules should be fat sound and followed rigorously, that every pound is precious and must not be wasted. But they want to shout about their record. Let them shout. Wages lower, taxes higher, borrowing higher, debt higher. Their chaos has a cost. Certainty is vital for the growth we need, essential for businesses and investors in our country. As we've spelt out, compared with a blanket cut to corporation tax, investment allowances are the right approach. But the question many businesses will ask today is, how long before the wind blows again and we all go through this again? And that's what they don't understand about business investment. Their endless fighting on tax is bad for growth in and of itself. 
Madam Deputy Speaker, real stability means that taxes don't go up and down like yo-yos. The R&D tax credit regime doesn't get overhauled twice in six months. Yeah. 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 Order. Okay, that's enough. I now can't hear the right honourable gentleman at all. Exactly. And it's nothing to do with being old. No. <laughs> Quiet. <laughs> so, Mr. Stormer. Thank you. Let me give an example of that instability. It's a bit of a fraught subject at the moment, but when he was Culture Secretary, the Chancellor apparently took some lessons on the rules of football. So let me provide a refresher. The amount of times his government has broken their fiscal rules, 11. That's one football team. The amount of times they've changed corporation tax policy, 22. That's two teams. You've got a game. But if he wants the post-max analysis, you'll have to consult the experts. Back on his screens and ours this weekend, I know the whole House will want to applaud that. But Madam Deputy Speaker, a budget is not just about the choices made, but the choices ignored. Britain needs more than certainty for growth. That's the least we should expect. We need change, stability and success. Anyone listening to this and worried about NHS waiting lists? Any about crime? It's about crime going unpunished. You don't want to hear, they don't want to hear, they don't want to hear about the waiting list. They don't want to hear about the crime going unpunished. House building rates falling. Don't want to hear about that either, I suppose, do you? They will have heard very little that makes them feel hopeful about our future. They could have used sensible taxation policies on non-DOMs or oil and gas companies and made the money work for working people, tackled the vested interests that gum up our planning system and shown real ambition on the investment we need to turn us into a green growth superpower. And that was the test today. Can we move beyond the usual sticking plaster solutions set a new direction for growth that serves the interests of working people. But I'm afraid the verdict on this budget is clear. They won't offer change because they can't. And so our course is set. Manage decline, Britain going backwards, the sick man of Europe once again. That's the Britain they've created and they should look it in the eye. Because today's figures on growth put their failures up in lights. After 13 years of Tory sticking plaster politics, 13 years of no growth for the many, 13 years of being asked to pay, working people are entitled to ask, am I any better off than I was before? Yeah. And after 13 years, with no excuses left, nobody left to blame, no ambition or answers, the resounding answer is no, and they know it. Right. Now, we'll just have things like, just settle down a bit now, please. And if people are leaving, let's do so quickly and quietly, just out of consideration for everyone else who is still taking part in the debate before I come to, come on, I'll get a move on. Before I come to the chairman, of the Treasury Select Committee, Harriet Baldwin. Yay! Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker, and wonderful to have you back Yay! in the chair today. Yay! After that torrent of socialist declinism from the opposition, Yay! I want to start by saying how lucky we are to have a lucky Chancellor. Yay! He has been lucky this winter because the weather has been a lot warmer than when he stood here in November. And as a result, the price of energy has come down. Yep. But he has also made some of his own luck, Madam Deputy Speaker, because thanks to the steps that he took, the financial markets have stabilized and he has had to pay less in interest than he was expecting to, about four billion pounds. It is actually quite hard to believe that this is the first actual official budget that we've had in this chamber since October 
2021. Our, a lot of things have changed since the last time we had a budget. Our world leading NHS vaccination rollout has ended the severe contagion of the pandemic, but Putin's evil and illegal invasion of Ukraine has sparked the worst inflation for 40 years. The challenges those events have placed on the public finances have been extraordinary, and the spending can't all be borrowed and passed on to the next generation. And that's why I welcome the news today from the Chancellor that he's forecasting 3% lower debt in years to come. Yeah. Our committee, the Treasury Committee, welcomes the fact that the budget is accompanied by forecasts from the Office for Budget Responsibility. We think uh, that it's important that that stands alongside a budget. It's a key part of the independent framework for chancellors, and we will be taking evidence from them next week on the underlying assumptions behind their forecasts. Because what has changed most perniciously since the last budget in October 2021 is inflation. It was only just beginning to rear its ugly head in October 2021. And as a member of the Treasury Committee throughout this entire period, I've been like Cassandra in highlighting some of the inflationary risks that we faced. Far from being transitory, as the Independent Bank of England hoped, inflation has become quite deeply embedded in the UK economy, in wage inflation and in expectations. And that's why I welcome the news today that the Office for Budget Responsibility is expecting that by the end of this year, inflation will be back down to 2.9% again, because inflation is the worst tax that we have on our economy. Yep. Yeah. It is a tax paid particularly by the very poorest who spend the highest proportion of their incomes on food and energy. And so the Chancellor must not hear the siren voices urging him to increase or to abandon the inflation target that he gives to the Independent Bank of England. The top priority for our economy this year must be to at least halve inflation. It's to be welcomed that in his budget today, the Chancellor has tried to focus on measures that help to achieve that inflation target. The extension of the fuel duty freeze and the cap on household energy costs will all help to keep inflation lower by almost 1%, uh, but lower than it would have been. And these may not feel like giveaways, but they do cost money against the do nothing counterfactual option. So it's good to see that they're being implemented because of better public finances and that these tax cuts can be seen as consistent with the government's second priority of reducing debt. In our recent Treasury Committee report, we called on the Chancellor to think again about the fiction that lies behind fuel duty forecasts. Every year, they get embedded in the fiscal outlook. And every year, Chancellors realise that it's not an ideal time to raise fuel duty. I welcome the fact that the uh, fuel duty cut has been extended for another year and that once again, uh, the fiction has not been followed through into reality. But I do think we need to think long and hard about why a tax that is inflationary, that harms growth, and is heading the way of the dodo as we all uh, move to electric cars, is still in the forecast numbers. The third economic policy of growing the economy in a non-inflationary way will involve all of us working more productively. And the Stride Review named after my illustrious predecessor, has rightly focused on this key, yeah, yeah, key yeah. question. And I think there were many measures that we can all see will be very helpful that were announced in today's uh, budget. Because with over one million job vacancies in our economy, we are still, as a country, working fewer hours than we were before the pandemic. And unlocking that human and economic <coughs> potential is key to strong, productive, non-inflationary growth. Mm -hmm. So the steps that have been announced today on childcare and on pensions will help to ease the labour shortages that are pushing up wage demands and they will help counter those inflationary pressures. And so the Treasury Committee looks forward to exploring all of these issues in detail with both our expert witnesses and with the Chancellor himself 
in our next evidence sessions because the details really matter. The Treasury Committee has highlighted the new benefit cliff edges that my right honourable friend introduced last November when he announced that next winter only low paid households will receive the £900 help with their cost of living. We ask for it to be spread into six instalments to reduce the risk of cliff edges. And we're sorry to hear that a somewhat clunky computer system means that there will be three instalments instead, because we worry that if you lose your job one day just after the qualifying date, you will miss out on a lot of help. And there are still cliff edges, taper rates and disincentives to work the law in our benefit and tax system, whether it's around free school meals, help with the childcare limits, child benefit tapers, tax-free childcare cliff edges, the withdrawal of a tax-free allowance, and the very welcome measures today announced on all those fronts and with the pension cap abolition will all be studied in detail by the committee. We're planning to work closely with our colleagues on the Work and Pensions Committee to find recommendations to smooth some of these cliff edges and distortions. And the Chancellor can see how these work as disincentives to adding more hours and every hour of work should pay. I think that we've made huge progress towards that today. I think at any stage in life and at any age, you should be rewarded more the more you work. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking briefly as a constituency MP, De uh, Madam Deputy yeah. Speaker, I just want to welcome the help for swimming pools, yeah. for our yeah. pubs, yeah. Uh, for levelling up uh, with more than theatres, and for our childcare providers and our nurseries. Yeah. I think there's a lot of very good news for them today. The Chancellor's had some luck since November, Madam Deputy Speaker. He's shared that luck with UK households today. He has a clear intention to bring down inflation, to grow the economy and to reduce debt. May good luck continue to follow him and may the extra billions of pounds of expense uh, to, that he's scoring for the defence budget yeah. help our Ukrainian friends yeah, have good yeah, luck yeah. and to beat back the Russian invader. Yeah, yeah. Slava Ukraini. Yeah. Yeah. Spokesman for the Scottish National Party, Stuart Hosey. Yeah. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I thought the chair of the select committee was about to launch a ship with that peroration at the end. If I may make a couple of small observations before I start, the Chancellor mentioned uh, Nigel Lawson and his deregulation budgets in the past, and he spoke about the resolution of um, Silicon Valley Bank. I hope this government learned the right lessons from those episodes, and indeed from the 2008-09 crash. Do not weaken regulation do not weaken tier one capital. Do not return the banking system into risk. Uh, can I also say I was intrigued by many of the things he said about reducing economic inactivity. I'm sure some of the measures may well work. I think to add more and brutal sanctions to universal credit claimants was probably rather unconscionable given everything else which is going on. He yeah, did yeah, seem yeah, to yeah, give yeah. the impression of broad sunlit uplands and there were lots of cheering and waving of order papers at the end. What the Chancellor actually described though, it was a UK economy which has gone from the most robust in the G7 to one of the weakest. A UK economy where Brexit slammed the brake on UK investment. Yeah. Uh, a UK whose performance deteriorated after the Brexit referendum both in absolute and relative terms. Uh, a country which unilaterally imposed trade barriers with its nearest neighbours. And a country, the only one in the G7, where the economy has not returned to its pre-pandemic level. Yeah, yeah. Now, one could make a case to say that was not all the fault of the government, but many of the difficulties were and many were caused by the disastrous fiscal loosening by his predecessor, the Right Honourable yeah. Member for Spelthorn. Yeah. And we can see the problem the economy faces through the prism of debt interest. Uh, he's right in terms of what he said compared to last November, 
four months ago. But year on year on year, the debt interest payments are 30, 40, 50, 60 billion pounds higher than they were a year ago. And for ordinary people, working people, the OBR confirmed in November, real household disposable income remains below the 2019-20 level and will do for the next four or five years. And I'm seeing nothing in the Red Book and the OBR forecast in the last few minutes 